Stephanie, you ready? Hi. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. I want to begin by commending President Biden for a career in public service, for a long, long career in representing and serving our country, and for his handling of the many difficulties and challenges, personal challenges and tragedies that he suffered during his life uh, with so much admirable conduct and the empathy that he derived from those experiences, and that he was always proficient at showing to the rest of us. Um, I want to add that he, a year ago, a little over a year ago, when I entered this race, I predicted that President Biden suffered from a degenerative condition that was not going to improve and that it would make it impossible for him to govern effectively. The reaction of the DNC to that obvious condition was to hide it from the American public and to use their power over the Democratic Party nomination process to make sure that nobody could compete with President Biden in a way that would expose his deficiencies. And as a result, we are where we are today, which is in a, a period of crisis. And we have two crises, and they both derive from the same condition. And that condition is the corporate the emergence of the domination of corporate power over American democracy that that accelerated beginning in 2010 with the Citizens United case that unleashed a tsunami of corporate money into the American political process. And both parties are now captured by that corporate money. And they've lost any kind of authentic connection to the American people or to the populist goals of the republic and of democracy. On the Republican side, President Biden promised the last time around that he was going to drain the swamp. Uh, but instead, he came in and he appointed a pharmaceutical lobbyist and uh, CEO to run HHS, a uh, Verizon lobbyist to run the FCC, a, a, a Goldman Sachs CEO to run the Treasury Department, an oil lobbyist to run the Interior Department, a coal lobbyist to run the Environmental Protection Agency, and so on. And only today, President Trump has announced that in his new administration, should he win this election, that Jamie Dimon will be his choice as Commerce Secretary and that Larry Flink, Fink, the director of BlackRock, will run the Treasury Department. This is the swamp. These are swamp creatures. And, uh, and his pick as vice president is a salute to the CIA and to the intelligence community and to the military industrial complex. And their gravy train is going to continue. And President Trump has a connection to the American people, a populist connection, but in many ways it's the same fraudulent connection that, the, that we saw with the DNC over the past year concealing the real purpose of their objectives, which was to give us a president that, uh, that represents corporate interests rather than the interests of the American public. We've seen two presidents who aren't really addressing any of the issues that America that are critical to our country. We have, if you look at President Biden and President Trump, you can look at them and say these are very different people. Their dispositions are different. Their personalities are different. Their expressed ideologies are very, very different. Their approach to politics could not be more distinct. But if you actually look at the policies over which they differ, over the landscapes in which they're staging this election, it's a very narrow Overton window of 
of guns, of culture war issues, of abortion, of trans rights, etc. And the big existential issues that are actually facing our country are never addressed. The biggest of these, perhaps, is the, is the national debt, which is now $34 trillion. The service on that debt alone is now greater than our, our military budget. Within five years, 50 cents out of every dollar that we collect in taxes will go to servicing that debt. Within 10 years, 100%. This is not sustainable. Uh, President Biden and President Trump offer no solutions. President Biden, on his, his web page, has no policy issues addressing this or any other policy. He has a picture of himself and, that, and saying that we're going to finish the job. But he doesn't set, tell what job he's going to finish. If it's the job of running up the deficit till it's completely unsustainable, that's something that the American people should know about. He, President Biden can't talk about it and President Trump can't talk about it because they're the ones chiefly responsible for, for running up that debt. President Trump came into office saying he was going to run the presidency as a business. He was going to balance the federal budget. And instead, he ran up an $8 trillion debt, more than all the presidents combined since George Washington. And President Biden is now on track to, met, to beat that number. So neither of them are even going to talk about this most existential issue. Another existential issue is our addiction to foreign wars. It, both men have said that they're against war, and both men are feeding the war machine. The Ukraine war is a war that should have never been fought. It should have been settled. President Putin has offered twice to settle that, that war on, on terms that were enormously beneficial to the Ukrainian people and to the American people and to our security in Europe. And yet, President Biden, President Putin initialed an agreement. President Zelensky uh, initialed that same agreement in April of 2022. And President Biden sent Boris Johnson over to force Zelensky to tear up that agreement. And since then, it's probable that over 500,000 Ukrainian kids have died unnecessarily in a war that is enriching BlackRock because they own all of the military contractors that are supplying that, that war. And BlackRock not only has the contract to destroy Ukraine, but it also now has the contract which President Biden gave them to rebuild Ukraine. Neither of these presidents is going to deal with the chronic disease epidemic. When my uncle was president, 6 percent of Americans had chronic disease. Today, 60 percent do. Diabetes alone, when I was a kid, the typical pediatrician would see one case of diabetes in his career, or 40 or 50 year career. Today, one out of every three children who walk through his office door is diabetic or pre-diabetic. And nobody's talking about why this is happening. The cost of dealing with mitochondrial disorders and our children dysfunction, which is diabetes, is now greater than our military budget. The biggest cost to our nation is the cost of treating chronic disease, $4.3 trillion annually. It's five times the the price of our military budget. And nobody's talking about why did autism go from one in 10,000 in my generation and 70 year old men today, right now, and yet my children's generation is one in every 34 kids, one in every 22 boys. Shouldn't we be looking into this? <clears throat> Shouldn't we be doing the science to figure out what's causing it? We know that it's an environmental exposure or an accumulation of environmental exposures. Genes don't cause epidemics. There has to be an environmental toxin. And all the, 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 the corrupt merger of state and corporate power has been overseen by both political parties. It's something neither of them, the capture of our agencies by the industries that they're supposed to regulate. They've been turned, our regulatory agencies have been turned into the sock puppets of the industries they're supposed to protect us against. And all of these are issues that are critical to the American people. And finally, the most existential issue of all, the toxic division that is destroying our country. 
and President Biden's the, the attempted assassination of President Trump this week is a symptom of that toxicity. We're now more polarized in this country than at any time since the American Civil War. And nobody can see an ending to this. If President Biden gets elected, it's going to become more toxic. If President Trump gets elected, it's going to become more polarized. And neither of these men, both of them say, both of them recognize this, this is existential. But both of them, neither of them can do anything about it. Why? Because they feed on it. They feed it. They fuel it. And they are the products of that division. So we need a leader who can stop feeding into the vitriol, stop feeding into the anger, stop feeding into the marginalization, the polarization, and who can find those values that bring Americans together rather than focusing on these toxic issues that are intended to keep us all apart. And it's the Black Rock, the State Street, the J.P. Morgan who are profiting from that division. The very people that President Trump has promised to appoint to run our government who are profiting on it because it's like the jangling of keys. They're saying, look over here, look at abortion, look at freedom of choice, look at, uh, look at uh, trans rights, look at gun rights. And while we're all staring at each other's throats on those issues on the jangly keys, they're robbing the bank over here. They're shifting the wealth upward to this new oligarchy of billionaires. And both President Trump and President Biden engineered the lockdowns in 500 days. They created 500 new billionaires, and they shifted $4.3 trillion northward from the American middle class to this new this new aristocracy that we have. And it's destroying our country. We need a change. If people want more of the same, they can vote Democrat and they can vote Republican. The only way we're going to get a change in this country is if people come together behind the one candidate who is independent, who has vowed to have a unity government to bring Republicans and Democrats and others all together in a way that finds common ground in our country. A candidate who's the only candidate who's pro-choice, who's pro-environment, who's pro-civil rights, and who beats Donald Trump by 14 percent. There is no other candidate who can beat John Donald Trump. Look at all the polls that have been done over the last year. I beat Donald Trump and nobody else can. Thank you very much. Talk about that moving forward on your kind of thoughts on being a neutral policy on who the, who the Democrats finally nominate. Well, I, you know, I, I care about our country more than I do about my election or anything else. And I think we need political parties that are at, actually attached to the American people that are serving the interests of our republic. And uh, the, if the Democrats do what I suspect they're going to do, which is to anoint Kamala Harris, a vice president who is monumentally unpopular within her own party. But they're doing it because it's the easiest way to hold on to the money, and it's the she's the president. And I think if they don't open up the process, that it really is going to discredit this political party. The I would remember all of my years. I can break the back of that to create the illusion of a democracy, but in fact, there, you know, it is a, it's a, it's a cabal that is choosing the same way the Soviet Union did. Uh, Russia has Russia has elections. Vladimir Putin wins with 88 percent of the vote because he controls who who can be his opponents. And he controls the media. And the same is true now of our political parties in this country. Would you open up to the possibility of taking part if there was an open convention you called for that? Is that something you would consider taking part? I would certainly listen to the party elders if they came to me. I, I would discuss something with them. I'm the only presidential candidate who can beat Donald Trump. And if I were them, I would do that. 
and I would certainly listen to their proposals. Will you actively seek out that nomination? You're saying if they come to you with no, the I, no I, I am very content running where I am. And I believe I can win this election. I believe at this point it's a two-man race or two-person race, let me put it that way. And, um, you know, and that I'm in the best position to win. And if the polling then shows that you're not in the best position, whoever the Democrats go with, whether it's Vice President Harris or someone else, will you, if you're, because what you cite often are your internal polls. So if your internal polls show that you will actually lose, would you step down and step aside? If well, you know, I would, get, that's an interesting proposal, and I would consider taking that proposal if the other candidates did the same. You mentioned Kamala Harris is who you said that the Democratic Party appeared poised to put into that position. You were critical there, obviously, of, of President Biden's policy. What, if anything, is different? How do you compare yourself to Kamala Harris if she does become the Democratic nominee for president? Well, I think, you know, Kamala Harris is the party of war. She is, uh, she's a war hawk. On, you know, the Democratic Party was always the peace party. Uh, Kamala Harris is a, a war hawk on Ukraine. She's a war hawk on, on China. I think that we should be figuring out ways to coexist with the rest of the world as best we can. Of course, we need to protect our national security. I think she's not going to do anything about the national deficit. I've never heard her speak about the chronic disease epidemic, about I think she's a product of the corporate control of our democracy. And she's one of the authors of, um, in, the, in terms of civil rights, she has one of the worst civil rights record of any public official. She's the author of the, uh, one of the primary authors of the school to prison pipeline. She kept 5,000 people despite a Supreme Court order that she released 5,000 prisoners and uh, of nonviolent drug crimes who were illegally in California jails. She kept them in there saying that we needed them for firefighting and for other public work services. And that's just a, made, a modern version of indentured servitude, a modern version of slavery. Uh, she was the leading, one of the le two leading public officials in California, which now has the worst education system, 49th in education outcomes in the country. 50% of the homeless people in our country are in California, and she was behind those policies. Oh, I don't think she has a good, um, I don't think, in terms of the traditional democratic principles, I don't think she has a credible record. In all the turmoil the past week, you ever had it gone through your mind you regret leaving the Democratic Party? Because with this turmoil, that might have left you as a front runner as we speak today. Well, I wouldn't be the front runner because if I, by, by the time I left the Democratic Party, it was really clear that, and this is the only reason I left, that the, that the rules have been rigged to prevent me from winning. So I would be in the same position as, as Dean Phillips is today or Mary Ann Williamson. I wouldn't, which is, you know, a sidelined. And the only way that I avoided getting sidelined was to leave the party, which neither of them were able to do. I go to a lot of your events, uh, and I heard your stump speech, and a lot of today was your stump speech, but you're still focusing a lot on President Biden. He is out of the race. In fact, at one point you even said, you know, well, highly critical of President Biden, he said if President Biden, you know, were to win, if Donald Trump were to win, but he's announced for hours now that he's out. Was that, or were you just confused or have you moved on from it? It was a little, it stood out. I was making a point about there being very, very little difference between the two parties and the modern, the, the current iteration of President Biden's policies is Kamala Harris, who has never voiced any differentiation, any distinction between herself and President Biden. Oh, you know, I can't, I'm not going to, you know, I just made some criticisms of her own policies, but I don't know what her national policy, there is no, there, there literally is no policy on their website. So we don't know what she stands for. Uh, my assumption is, according to her, that she stands for all the things that President Biden stood for. Bob, There's does no today's difference. news affect your campaign moving forward? Well, this, I think, I think everything affects my campaign. I can't tell you how, and I try not to make predictions because I, I try not to do spin. And I think, you know, as any of you can see, that we're living in a very, very dynamic 
situation now. It's unprecedented in American history. In fact, the closest thing to this, you know, when I look back on American history is the 1968 primaries where my father participated and was killed. And ironically, these, you know, the convention, the Democratic convention this year is being held once again in Chicago. And in 1968, the Democratic Party tried to fix that con that convention with Mayor Daley basically anointing uh, Hubert Humphrey, who was the DNC's choice. And there was chaos that erupted and it destroyed the Democratic Party for, for a decade. So I think we have a lot to learn from that history, as I think Mark Twain said that, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes, and it's, it's really rhyming right now. Mr. Kennedy, you said you are the candidate to beat Donald Trump. You mentioned that multiple times yet. You know, I think in the debate in June, you failed to qualify for that. What is it that you see that makes you confident that you can not only beat Donald Trump, but also whoever the candidate will be well, Democratic I, I would point out to you that I qualified for the debate better than any other candidate. Clearly, we all see today that President Biden is not going to be on any ballot. I was on the ballot, and I have enough signatures to be on the ballot today in 29 states. I had, uh, I, I exceeded the polling thresholds that CNN has established. I had six polls where I was from their name polling groups, where I was over 15%, and they arbitrarily excluded them. So I believe that I will continue to uh, qualify for the next debate, and hopefully they'll put me on the stage this time. Let's go. If you don't make the debate the next time, will you take that as a sign? Break off a no, time? I'm not going to. That, that That's would so be sick. the That's opposite of a sign. That would be... I would be the networks well, colluding we can go to the corner with corner. the parties to, to keep me here. off the stage, which they did the last time. So I'm not going to cave into that just because, you know, your networks are saying, are, are fencing me out, which they are. I'm not, you will not see me on ABC, CBS, NBC, or CNN doing a, uh, an, uh, doing a, uh, a, a, a live interview. They won't let me on. They're colluding with the Democratic Party to keep me out of the limelight. If you remember when when uh, Ross Perot ran, he was on CNN every night. That's why he got so popular. I have greater popularity than Ross Perot without ever getting on the network. Only one time have I been allowed on the network in a, in a live interview, and that's with Aaron Burnett, and they never did it again. <laughs> and we asked them, Stephanie Spears right here, my press secretary, who's on the phone every day with the bookers from every one of those, and they just say, no, we're not going to let him on. So there is a, there's a, a monolithic um, uh, wall the television networks that are owned by the public, those airwaves, are licensed to use them, but those airwaves are owned by the American public. We used to have an equal time rule. We used to have a fairness doctrine that would make those networks put me on. But today we don't, you know, those laws have been gutted and, uh, and they're able to just, uh, to, to make common cause with the Democratic Party to make sure the American public does not see a live interview with me. Thanks, Bob. I'd like to ask one final hmm. question, touching back to the events of last week. I've noticed you have Secret Service protection now. On a personal level, for you and your family, your thoughts on that, uh, having that now as you move forward? I'm very grateful for it. I, you know, um, I'm, uh, listen, it's intrusive for me, so I, it's like, you know, be careful what you pray for. Um, but I'm very grateful for it because, you know, when my father was shot, there were six bystanders shot that night, including Paul Schrade, who took a bullet to his head, one of my father's best friends. When my uncle, President Kennedy, was shot, there were, Governor Conley was also shot. When Ronald Reagan was shot, uh, 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 Mr. Brady was also shot. Oh, in almost all of these attempts at assassination, and when, you know, President uh, Trump was shot last week. There was also a bystander who we all pray for who was killed and two others grievously wounded. Oh, it's very important to me to have the Secret Service here, not so much for my own protection, 
but to protect people, to, to dissuade people who might want to attack me and who might hurt a, uh, or even kill a, a bystander. Any final comment, Mr. Kennedy? Oh, I'm good. Thank you all very much for coming out here on a Sunday. Let's just go in the corner.